Um, my name is Jay Solomon. I'm an adjunct fellow here at the Washington Institute. And I published a book last year called The Iran Wars. So maybe I know a little bit about this subject. But um, let me start by this, um, our discussion today is about just how much influence um, the United States really has over um, activities or policies or the Iranian people inside of Iran. And a common perception is that it, amongst many foreign policy circles going back 40 some odd years was that Jimmy Carter essentially lost Iran in 1979 when Islamic fundamentalists overthrew the U.S. Bak Shah and a confused and chastened Washington establishment basically stood passively by. And then the rise of the Ayatollah Khomeini ushered in a, a hardline Islamist government that's challenged U.S. policy for nearly five decades. But Stu Eisenstadt has recently written a, a book called Jimmy Carter, The White House Years, and he, and he challenges this assumption. Um, he documents in this book in a very precise way the way the presidency, uh, the, the failures in the Carter administration um, in responding to the revolution and the ensuing hostage crisis. Um, this, this included what he describes as a massive U.S. intelligence failure that imperiled Washington's ability to accurately gauge the Shah's political strength in comparison to his rivals. The book, uh, the book also documents the significant splits between Carter's top advisors, particularly National Security Advisor Zbig Brzezinski and the U.S. Ambassador on the ground in Iran, William Sullivan, over how far to go in trying to save the Iranian monarch, who served at the time as a central pillar in the U.S.'s efforts to minimize Soviet influence in the Middle East. Still, Eisenstadt ultimately is skeptical that an outside power like the U.S. could have saved the Shah, given the corruption inside his government and the repression of the Iranian people. He writes, did Jimmy Carter lose Iran? No, the Shah of Iran, in power for almost four decades, lost his own country. There were limits to what the United States could do to save an unpopular ruler, as the Eisenhower and Kennedy administrations learned in Cuba with Fidel Castro's revolution against Batista, and the Obama administration discovered years later when dem demonstrators in Cairo drove President Mubarak from, uh, from power. So Stu's book, An Analysis of the 79 Re Revolution, I think is a great entry point to analyze and discuss just how much influence the U.S. really has in impacting the calculations and policies of the Islamic Republic and the Iranian people. Just this week, the Trump administration began reimposing sanctions on Tehran in an effort to force the country's government to curb its military and espionage operations in a host of Middle East hotspots and to renegotiate the landmark nuclear deal it reached with the Obama administration and five world powers in 2015. Some of Trump's more hawkish supporters and advisors have suggested that sanctions could lead to a collapse of the Iranian economy and potentially force regime change in the country. But is the Trump administration, is it a realistic strategy? And what does history tell us about Washington's use of military and economic power to sway Iran's leadership and people? Uh, and that's really the focus of our discussion today. And I will say at the outset, there's still a lot of debate amongst the American and European di diplomats about whether economic sanctions really were the reason why Iran came to the nuclear ne negotiating table in 2013. And some veterans of the Bush administration still play with the idea that was, Iran was vulnerable to regime change shortly after the fall of Saddam Hussein in 2003. So let me start with our great um, panel here. First here is the author, Stu Azenstadt, who's a senior counsel at Covington and Burling and served in two top posts in the Democratic administrations, which placed him at the center of the U.S. conflict with Iran. This, these posts included his position as Jimmy Carter's top domestic policy advisor during the 1979 Islamic Revolution and the ensuing hostage crisis. And he was also the Under Secretary of State and Deputy Treasury Secretary at a time when the Clinton administration was ratcheting up economic san sanctions on Iran in the late 1970s. As I said, 1990s. 1990s. Thank you. As I was saying, this year, Stu published the, a definitive book on the Carter presidency, which exhaustively documents Carter's response to the revolution and the rise of Islamic fundamentalism in the country. On my left is Merengiz Carr. 
She's a prominent Iranian lawyer and human rights activist who's been at the center of the drive to promote democracy and women's rights in Iran. She is currently based at Brown University's Pembroke Center for, te for Teaching and Research on Women and is the author of the book Crossing the Red Line, which documents the struggle for human rights in Iran. She was presented the National Endowment for Democracy's Democracy Award in 2002, which was presented her by then First Lady Laura Bush. And on the end, we have Mekdikology, who is the Libitsky Family Fellow at the Washington Institute, uh, where he studies the internal politics of Iran and the numerous Shuite groups operating across the Middle East. He's studied theology at a seminary in the Iranian holy city of Akom and went on to study philosophy. He led a career in journalism working at numerous Iranian publications, the BBC and Radio Farda, before jo joining the Institute. So thank you all. Um, I would like to start first uh, and maybe do 20 or 25 minutes of discussion and then open up uh, to all of you. But first, I'd like to start with just Stu. And h how do you respond in the book and in just in general to the idea that the Shah could have been saved or that more could have been done uh, by the Carter administration to save him? Well, I, I'm extremely candid and self-critical about our Iranian policy. Uh, I think it was the single worst intelligence failure in American history, perhaps worse even than the absence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. The CIA, which had reinstalled the Shah after a coup with uh, uh, British intelligence in 1953, uh, did not know that for five years he was getting cancer treatments and how sick he was. They didn't appreciate that his domestic support rested on quicksand and that he had lost the support of broad swaths of society, including the merchant class, intellectuals, and others, not simply the fundamentalists. They didn't appreciate the impact that Khomeini's provocative cassettes in exile outside of Paris were having in stirring up a revolution. So all of those are givens. Uh, I state them very clearly, <clears throat> and it was not until a year after Carter's famous or now infamous statement uh, on uh, New Year's Eve 1977 that the Shah was presiding over an island of stability in the midst of a region in chaos, not only uh, almost a year before there was a major uh, interact interagency study involving the president looking at Iran. I mean, we simply did not have the kind of on-the-ground intelligence to tell, tell us what was happening. Now, having said that, I want to be very clear and very blunt. The Shah himself made huge mistakes, including being repressive, not reaching out to the de democratic opposition, keeping the military services totally separate from each other, uh, and then ultimately and he says it in his own memoirs, and Zahidi, his last ambassador to Washington, said it to me, that when push came to shove, he refused to use ultimate force against the demonstrations. Now, with respect to Carter, beside the intelligence failures, there was, in fact, a split within the administration, a tripartite split. On the one hand, we had a really rogue ambassador, William Sullivan, who wrote in 78 a cable to the State Department called Thinking the Unthinkable, which advocated at that point reaching out to Khomeini, saying that the Shah was through. Carter was so angry about it, he told Vance to fire him, and that didn't happen. Uh, you had in the center Vance, who did not favor reaching out to Khomeini, but who urged the Shah to reach out to the nonviolent, non-fundamentalist opposition. And then you had Zbig on the right, who felt that given the history of revolutions, whether it was the Bolshevik Revolution, the French Revolution, uh, that revolutions happen if reforms occur and there's no order in advance. And Zbig said, you've got to restore order by all means. 
including military force. And ironically, and I think I show in the book, the Shah was not a sort of one-dimensional dictator. Um, in many ways, and in the interviews I've done with Khomeini's own people, they indicate that it was in many ways his reforms that got ahead of society. Land reform, which made the landowners uh, angry. Reform on small business, uh, empowering women and so forth. So ironically, in many ways his reforms were part of the problem. So his big notion was you can't do that until you restore order, you can't go any further. And therefore the Shah did get confusing signals from Washington. There's no question about it. On the other hand, it absolutely is untrue that Carter, in some naive way of applying human rights to uh, the Shah, undercut him. He clearly did not. He didn't publicly ever use the kind of human rights uh, language and policy he applied in Latin America or to the Soviet Union. He quietly said to him, you should reach out to some of the opposition, but he constantly, publicly supported the Shah when Sullivan didn't want to and even taking a more hawkish position than Vance. So there's no question that the Shah was confused about the signals, but there's also no question but that even had there been clearer signals, and again, Carter as late and General Heiser, who he sends over, as late as December 78, Carter says, the Shah is someone we must support, even if it means a military government. Um, so he was getting those kinds of signals. And Carter does the following, and then I'll close. When he finally gets the kind of intelligence that he was deprived of for a year, and Admiral Turner, his CIA director, said in an interview to me, we let Carter down terribly. When he finally understands the depth of opposition, he sends Senator Byrd over, the majority leader, to meet with him and give him assessment. He sends Mike Blumenthal, the Secretary of Treasury, over to get an assessment, both of, both of whom say he is really losing his support. He appoints George Ball to do a top-to-bottom review, looking at all the cables. Ball says the Shah is lost. The only thing we can do is create some sort of a national unity government and have him as a figurehead. Carter rejects that advice because it would undercut the Shah. So time and again, he rejects, whether it's Sullivan, whether it's Ball, the notion that we simply could walk away with, from the Shah. Again, had we from the outset taken Zbigniew's position and said the only thing that will save you is military force, maybe temporarily that would have worked, but the Forces in opposition, I believe, were so strong that it was just a question of time. And I make the case in a comparison with Eisenhower in 59 in Cuba, 90 miles away, and we couldn't control it. Obama with Mubarak. There are simply limits to how far we can go to control uh, situations where we don't have a full understanding. And, and the last point I would make, in addition to the CIA's failure, Gary Sick, who was our NSC advisor uh, from the National Security Council, said you could fill an ocean with what we did not know for decades about Iran. Here was our principal ally, tens of billions of dollars of military assistance, which Carter, by the way, amplified. We even reached a civilian nuclear agreement with him. And yet, we simply did not know what was happening internally, and part of that was because the Shah didn't want us to know. He limited the CIA's ability to do internal intelligence. Savaki said, my intelligence service is where I'm going to do it. You ha can have a CIA station, but it has to be pointed at the Soviet Union, not internally. So we weren't getting the kind of information that would have provided, uh, I think, a, you know, a good uh, result. We can talk about the hostage crisis later. This is not a book that could have been titled If He'd Only Listened to Me. <laughs> I've talked about all my mistakes as well. This is one case where Zbig and I gave advice when the hostages were taken, he should have followed, which is immediate military action. Not bombing Tehran, but blockading Kark Island, where 60% of their oil imports, uh, exports came from, uh, to show that we simply would choke that economy if we had to, to get our hostages out. 
Uh, instead, he meets with the hostage families and in a humanitarian gesture says, my number one priority is to get your loved ones out safe and sound, which he did 444 humiliating days later. And I think that was a major mistake. Meringues, I'd like you to chime in here as a, you were a young lawyer back in 1979, but from, from your view, could the U.S. have done anything really to save the Shah, and what was the, the legacy of how the Shah was removed and, and the impact of U.S. policy on Iran? First of all, I would like to say hello and thank you for having me on this panel, and I appreciate for your book. Hello. Yes. Okay. Hello to everyone. And I'd like to thank you for having me in this panel. And I would like to thank you, Mr. Eisenstadt, for your efforts to show an important section, um, and a dark section of Iranian revolution in your book. It's very important because I have lived in Iran during Shah, and I have lived the revolution in Iran as well, and also the reform era, and now it's been 17, um, 17 years that I have moved to the U.S. And I would like to introduce myself a little bit more, so if I have an opinion here in this room, I would like that opinion doesn't make any misunderstanding. I am against the current regime in Iran. As the more it, it lasts in Iran, the more um, damages it makes to the Iranian people. And it, and it does not take any responsibility over its own people and its own citizens. In, in my own case, about me and my family, it just destroyed our family. I was seven, I was 58 years when I moved to the U.S. after I freed from the prison. I was freed and I moved to the U.S. and they did all the best they could so they stopped letting me back to Iran. So I would like to, I would like you to, to, to see me as a person who is not allowed to go back to Iran. And at the same time, I do have my own opinions for Iranians because I have worked in Iran as a, as a lawyer, as a columnist in Iran for 22 years. And I have written more than 15 books about laws and about its dysfunctionality in Iran. So I am totally familiar with the Iranian society, and I very well know even those people who took part in the Iranian revolution after they realized what Khomeini and his group of people, what they do, they blamed all the mistakes to President, Pre President Carter. And even in their, and even among themselves, they, 
even their, in their own private parties, they would say that um, Carter's democracy was a democracy. Even now, they feel the same after all these years, because not everybody is a politician. But here, I would like to I would, like to, I would like to mention a point on top of all the points that Mr. Eisenstadt has put in his book. Before the revolution, maybe one or two years before the revolution, we realized that we realized about an open atmosphere, political atmosphere, and it was said that Carter had, Carter had, had or, it was said that Carter had ordered uh, Shah about this um, open political atmosphere so the Shah would last and survive in his power. If you want to compare the situation to the Cold War era, Iran was, an, was a U.S. ally and it was neighboring the Soviet Union. So even if Shah wanted to bring democracy, even if he wanted, he couldn't bring the democracy that Carter wanted because immediately Savak would react. And go, uh, and, go, and go for the people who were who were doing this all activity to to just blame him or her closer to the Soviet. So it wasn't only the Jimmy Carter who made mistakes because he didn't know about the details. But it was the Shah himself who made the biggest portion about the biggest portion of mistakes. Maybe it was because he was sick and he was on medication, but he he should have entered negotiations with President Carter. He should have convinced Carter that it's a close society. It's a boiling pot. And if we just open it, all of a sudden, we have no idea what go what's going to happen. But Shah did not walk into these negotiations with President Carter. In my opinion, he didn't even um, walk into that negotiations. But Jimmy Carter was a president of a superpower, and he should have convinced Shah and Shah should have convinced Carter that it's a closed society and I'm not going to accept your order. But I would like to ask you to give me a framework, a frame time of like about five years so I can do the gradual reforms and I promise that like within five years we can enter a different era of life and ties, political and social ties with Iranian people. So, in this kind of situation, all of a sudden we woke up a day and we realized that the open political situation has implemented and the lid of that boiling pot has been lifted and a beast came out of that part that we know. And the Iranian people, Iranian nation, has no idea for how many years has to deal with that beast. 
I'm not sure when the effects of that beast is going to disappear with all the sanctions and all the international politics. I will elaborate later, and I would like to thank the author about his book. Mekti, I'd like you to weigh in as a third party on, you know, could the Shah have survived and some of these mistakes that both Marangese and, and Stu have outlined? Um, this is one of the big ifs of the history, which is very difficult to uh, answer. <coughs> but let me tell you something. <coughs> if you look at the Islamic Republic in terms of its um, political nature and the situation of Iran uh, after 40 years, you would see that the level of oppression cannot be compared to the period of Shah. Uh, I give you an example. According to the official statistics by the Bunyad Shahid, the foundation of martyrdom, uh, the whole people who were killed for political reason for in any way, either in prison or on the demonstrations, on um, in you know when they were cracked down by police or Sawak, during 27 years of Shah's rule, during 27 years of Shah's rule does not exceed uh, mm, 3,000 people. While in Islamic Republic, only in 1988, we had more than 5,000 people killed in prison just in the summer. And uh, I mean, the, the, this Islamic Republic have killed much more people, have uh, limited the freedom of uh, speech, freedom of um, you know the cultural freedom, the social freedom, and it's a kind of if is if Shah's regime was a dictatorship, a conventional dictatorship, this regime is a form of totalitarianism, of what is called by some political scientists a new kind of fascism. So the question is that why? Shah could not survive more than 27 years, but Islamic Revo Republic survived now 40 years, and there is no clear prospect for the regime change in near future. Why the level of suppression is higher, but the hope for regime change is much, much less? I think that's a big question. My answer is that we do not have uh, any clear alternative for Islamic Republic. And uh, when we don't have an, an alternative, and at the same time, the memory of revolution is still alive, and the Iranian people has gone through two uh, devastating trauma, trauma of revolution and trauma of eight years Iran-Iraq war. They are so cautious about um, going toward regime change through violent means and with no clear idea about what's going to substitute the Islamic Republic. Uh, I would like to quote um, a person because you know sometimes we talk about Iran and especially people who do not like us say that you are outside Iran, you are out of touch, you know. I would like to uh, quote Abbas Abdi, who is very well known for my dear friend John, uh, one of the hostage, hostage takers in 1979. And he's a prominent uh, reformist figure, as well as he's expert in polling. And he had a polling center in Iran for which he was arrested and spent a few years in prison. Yesterday, he spoke in the, at the University of Tehran and uh, this is what he says to students, that m about 85% of Iranian people, according to several polls, which are done in Iran, 
independent polls. And he talks about, you know, that last year we had a you know, good opportunity to, to talk. We had more freedom to go, do polls in Iran. He says that m about 85% of Iranians have no hope in the government. And he says that people are hopeless about uh, government achievements and they are so concerned about the future. He says that people have no hope in future of the country. And when the society is pessimistic about the future, the whole public opinion gets affected by it. And he's, he's talking about the uh, drastic changes in uh, people's mind, especially on two fields. One is the women issue, and another thing is religion. So if you had in you know, 70s and 80s, uh, in 60s and 70s, we had the rise of Islamism, I mean, not only in Iran, but also in other places in the Muslim world. Now, Iran could be considered one of the, I mean, socially, one of the most secular countries in Islamic world. And at least after the experience of Islamic Republic, I mean, talking about fundamentalism or, you know, Islamic utopia is, is ridiculous in Iran. And it says that 50% of Iranians do not fast. Not only do not fast, they have no problem to show it in public that they don't fast. And you know that that's, this is a crime. In Iran, if you show in Ramadan, if you show that you don't, you know, you, if you eat in public, police arrest you. So we have this kind of society. It's secularized. It's very much more pro-American. Um, it's under huge suppression by the government. We have a crazy government who makes people suffer, at the same time spend money for its uh, you know, regional ambitions. So it's very important to think about regime change. Why does not happen? Why people, ordinary people, even, op even opposition, why they are not that much enthusiastic about regime change? Yeah. So if I may just add a uh, comment to both. Sure. I mean, one of the reasons, and I'll be very frank, that I'm haunted by the question you asked, could this have been avoided, is because they're not only so internally repressive, but their support for Hamas, for Hezbollah, uh, Mark Ginsburg was saying even for uh, Al-Qaeda, uh, their nuclear ambitions and so forth are a threat to all of our values and to Israel. And I see in the Washington Institute, which I have a great respect for with Mark Rob Satloff and others, to me they are a major, maybe the major threat in the world. So the question goes back, could we have done something more? In addition to what I've, I've already mentioned, please remember that the president sent uh, a three-star general who was the deputy head of NATO, General Heiser, on a military mission whose job was to buck up the military. He came the day after the Shaw left, and his job was to buck up the military against Khomeini. And the military, without the Shaw's leadership, as one of the generals said, quoted in the book, we melted like a snowflake. They had never had a joint command. The Shaw wanted to keep them all separate. Heiser was constantly undercut by Sullivan, the ambassador. Uh, but again, Carter was making those last efforts, even after the Shah left, to block Khomeini. Now, Zbig wanted a total military coup, and Heiser was not charged with that, but he was charged with trying to support Bakhtiar, who was the last prime minister of the Shah, uh, and have a legitimate government against Khomeini. Number two, disclosed for the first time in my book, through my efforts and President Carter's, we saved 50,000 Iranian Jews and Christians and Baha'is from Khomeini's grasp by special visa exceptions. 
to the executive order that expelled all Iranians, and there were over 100,000 in the U.S. after the hostages were taken, because it would have been a death sentence to the Iranian Jew Jewish students to go back. We got 50,000 out through consulates who were instructed to allow them in under an asylum process, and we basically said, don't judge the asylum applications until the Shah is returned to the throne, knowing that that would be never. Um, and at the end of uh, our administration, when the Reagan administration started processing these asylum applications and sending some people back, I called Elliot Abrams and told him about the secret deal we'd made. So we were under no misapprehensions about the, the repression even then uh, that, uh, that, that was occurring. And it's interesting also that when the president would raise the opposition, the Shah would always say, it's the communists who are demonstrating. When we had November of 1977, the first state visit by the Shah uh, for this administration, and the student demonstrators were in Lafayette Park, uh, and the Park Service put tear gas to break them up, and it comes over into the South Lawn. I've got pictures of the Shaw and the president, you know, with the handkerchiefs. The Shaw insisted that the president privately, these were communists, kept saying it was the communist problem, it was the Soviets who were stirring it up. So there was no sense on his part, or if there was, he certainly was misleading, that, that this was a fundamentalist revolution as well. Can, can you talk a little bit more, too, in the book about how it went from you and others pushing, when the hostage crisis broke out, pushing for some sort of economic Yes, yeah, so this is really— And then it yeah. went, ended up into a military operation. Yes, yeah, so this is really interesting because it's very topical today. So I have gone through two sanction regimes with Iran. The first was after the hostages were taken, I was charged with coordinating economic sanctions within our government and then working with the State Department and Treasury to get our allies to back us up. And remember, this was a violation of every principle of international law uh, to take the hostages. We got virtually no support from our allies. We urged them to cut off Iranian oil imports. They wouldn't do it. We urged them not to buy any products from Iran. They wouldn't do it. And so at that time, we did not have secondary sanctions. I'll get to that in a second. And so we were basically unilaterally imposing sanctions, mm. and it wasn't enough. Now, the second iteration was in the Clinton administration. Uh, I had been ambassador to you. I came back to be Under Secretary of Commerce, Under Secretary of State, and Deputy Treasury Secretary. But here, when I was Under Secretary of State and then Deputy Treasury Secretary, we had the Iran Libya Sanctions Act. And those were secondary sanctions, like the ones today, on European and other countries that were doing business with Iran. And as Under Secretary of State, with the White House's support, the President's support, I negotiated a waiver for the European Union of the secondary sanctions in return for which they pledged the EU and did to cut off dual-use products and to basically tighten their economic relationships. So now what we're facing is a third iteration, and in this case, again, we're dealing with secondary sanctions. But what's changed between the Carter era and the Clinton era, and today, is that our economic power uh, with respect to Iran is overwhelming. And if a company like Total has to choose between doing business with the United States or doing business with Iran, it's going to pull out, as it did. Uh, we, you know, the SWIFT system, we're basically blocking the EU from dollar-denominated transactions. There's no bank in the world that is going to basically buck those secondary sanctions. So I think that these secondary sanctions are going to be much more effective. I can't imagine the president negotiating the kind of waiver that I did in the Clinton administration. 
And therefore, I think the pain on Iran will be much more severe. Now, mind you, it also will be a pain in terms of our European allies. The EU, when I was ambassador there, is doing everything humanly possible to set up alternative payment systems. They put their own blocking legislation in, which makes it illegal for a European company or a European affiliate of an American company to abide by the secondary sanctions, putting those companies in an exquisite vice between our secondary sanctions and the EU. But I think in the end they realize that you probably won't sanction them, and I think that the, therefore the secondary sanctions, which will be very divisive with respect to U.S. transatlantic relations, could have much more of an impact and already are beginning to do so. Thanks. I'm curious, because we're discussing about how much influence U.S. has in Iran. After the Iran-Iraq war broke out, sitting in Tehran, was there a perception, because the U.S. policy was kind of, first we supported Saddam, and then we had the Iran-Contra issue and, and se selling weapons to Iran. Did, did the Iranian people think the U.S. was going to try to interfere more to bring the, even more dramatically, to try to bring the, sh the Shah back or to bring the Islamic Republic down in those years where it was not yet totally consolidated? I cannot say for sure how many percentage of the people wanted the Shah back after they knew Khomeini. It was not like that. But they realized that they were deceived. And they try to blame it to others. Sometimes they say that it was it was BBC that did the revolution. Of course the Carter of, of course Carter President Carter was always um, the main people to blame the revolution on. I was not a diplomat but I can say what I witnessed according to my experience. As an Iranian, I am so ashamed of being an Iranian in this in this room because of the hostage taking happened in my country. It was an event that it was an event that split the people even the ones who were not supporting Shah. One group, they really disliked what happened, and they hated what happened, and the students climbed up the, um, the, the consulate, the US consulate in Iran. And and Carter believed that his own, believed that if, if it was, and Khomeini thought that his own leadership would be weakened, so, so he overreacted in a way that he, Khomeini came out and said that the leaders are these students and not me. In that time, we, the people who were against the hostage taking, we had a hope inside. We hoped that the U.S. would not let all these diplomats to stay in such a situation, and it will do something to, to save them. We were sure that the U.S. will do something to weaken this, this uh, new government in Iran, but it did not happen. We waited and it did not happen. And what happened was that this they, they chose to go after some not very productive ways to save the hostage taking. And after the, all these attempts were failed, and it all came in Stu's book, after all the efforts failed, the people which I was also among them, we also were lost, we also failed. 
because we believe that leaning to the U.S. could be a solution to weaken this government was not credible anymore. And the Eagle's Claw operation was a reason that we lost hope. The Iranian government said that this operation was a miracle, God's miracle, that according to the God's will, God's will decided that this operation to fail. So again, they, they tied it to some religious stories. So the belief that the U.S., the people who believe that the U.S. will support its own citizens hostage in Iran, as a superpower, and we didn't expect a superpower to, to wait and forget its own diplomats for 444 days being taken in Iran. I'd like to take the take the opportunity from the presence of Mr. Limbert here as a hostage to go back to the story of hostage taking. That consulate, the U.S. consulate in Iran, was the center of some events. Hmm. <laughs> There were two kinds of Iranians in those days. One group was us, the people who were thinking of us. We used to go to the um, embassy and the streets around it to look what's, what's happening. And the other group were the students who were excited and they were taking all the documents and papers out of the embassy to put them in the cars. And we were angry. We were angry that the U.S.'s power was, was ridiculed. If we spoke, we could have been labeled as U.S. spies. And God knows what would happen to us. So it was a center for us to look, to, to observe. And the streets around the embassy was full of this. Um, people who were selling food and nobody could do anything. I mean, I mean the split between the nations sometimes is because of the mistakes that the super superpowers are made. And it becomes very dangerous because an ideological Islamic government would take the opportunity and, and, and strengthen itself. There were other issues like sending arms to Saddam and to Iran from the Western countries. There were all reasons that made us suffer and face an eight-year war that took all the powers from us because talking about the human rights we're, we're not an option anymore because, because we are not taken as considered as a human being anymore because we couldn't speak. We were mourning for eight years. We were watching. And all the time, all these years, people were mourning for the martyrs, for the 
people got killed and displaced in Iran, and issues like compulsory, compulsory hijab and civil society and women rights were not the issue anymore because they were all ignored and because the country was in war. It was war torn. So the priority were changed. I remember, I remember that I had to cover my nose because because the buildings were full of the, the people. So all these, all these situations, because of the war, it created, it paved the way for the corrupted companies and organizations like IRGC to, to create and get shaped because the other parts of the country were busy with, with the war and support the people who were suffering the war or the people or the soldiers. Khomeini told that it was a blessing, the war was blessing, but it was a disaster for the people. So, I am critical to that part of the American policy to send arms to Iran and to Saddam. I would like to criticize that part of the policy. And I believe that this enabled without the policy makers know it, this established the Iranian society. Mike, Mac do you think most Iranians thought the U.S. was going to be even more engaged in trying to sort of topple the regime once the Iran-Iraq war started? Yeah, l let me tell you something. Th there is a similarity between um, Iranian people and um, U.S. governments in general in terms of the regime change. Because Iranians once united, many Iranians once united the states to change regime in Iran, but they want to take the credit for it because they want to say that, you know, we are a proud nation, we are not, you know, we are able to handle our uh, situation or solve without any help with the United States. Uh, this is what we see in Washington too. They are expecting Iranian people to change the regime, and but they want to take the credit for it. And uh, this is not going to work. Um, Iranians, you know, the, the Green Movement was an interesting experience we had. Because when Green Movement um, started, um, President Obama has already sent two letters to Ayatollah Khomeini, and he started a very, you know, unprecedented effort to engage with Iran. So he was surprised by Green Movement. What we were hearing from Tehran was a mixed message. Uh, ordinary people were shouting on the streets and asking President Obama to help them. You know, they were saying, even they were criticizing Mr. Obama for not being more active in supporting the Green Movement. On the other hand, we're hearing from the leaders of the Green Movement that please, you know, don't, don't come to us. Don't say anything. Don't, you know, don't do anything which makes us uh, look associated in any way to you. Um, on the other hand, we had, you know, similar dilemma here. Many people think that if Iranian government today, today, Iranian government announced that, like what Gaddafi did two years before his collapse, that I'm going to give up my nuclear program, I'm going to give up my missile program, I'm going to give up my support to the to the you know, fundamentalists and terrorists in the region, what's going to happen? Nothing happened inside Iran. The government continues to suppress people. And this is why many people in Iran say that U.S. issue, U.S. problem, U.S. concern is not Iranian people. And if you look at the sanctions, what's what are the purpose of the sanctions to bring Iran into the negotiation table again 
on you know nuclear program and on other programs like missile programs. It has nothing to do with the situation inside. So people have ambivalent feeling about what United States has done, what is doing, and what is going to do. And actually, if you look at the history, the history, if has anything to teach us, um, it says that you know, United States was not basically interested in limiting the government's ability to repress people, to enforce uh, the government, to force the government to respect human rights and the uh, rights of uh, citizen. And uh, at some point, this pressure may lead to some sort of compromise on you know, foreign policy, but so what? Right. So what? Uh, Iranians are victims of United uh, are, are victims of Iran's foreign policy, are victims of Iran's regional policy, but at the same time they don't think that the price they pay for this would help them to change anything inside. So I'd like to make three quick points. The first is to disabuse you of any notion that the Carter administration was trying to suggest or impose a sort of liberal Western democracy on uh, the Shah. Absolutely untrue. Totally, completely untrue. Second, it's important to understand how the hostage crisis arose. So Khomeini comes back in February of 79. Very shortly thereafter, students, in this case they were communist students, try to storm the U.S. Embassy, February of 79, not November of 79. And Khomeini permits his essentially secular government, Yazdi as foreign minister, etc., to get the Iranian police to get them out. Okay. Third, we finally discover the Shah is dying of cancer. He goes from one country to another. He petitions to come to the United States. A campaign is organized by David Rockefeller and Henry Kissinger to say that if Carter doesn't allow him in, an ally of 30 years, it will show how weak he is. We have to stand behind our principal ally. There's a seminal meeting I mentioned in a book in which every single person, including people who had been more dovish, Mondale and Vance, say, You've got to let him in. They didn't want him in, but they said, you have to. We can't take this kind of pressure to look bad. And Carter says, what will you advise if they storm the embassy and take our diplomats as hostage? And so before he makes a decision, he goes back to the Iranian government at the time and explains that the only reason the Shah is going to be allowed in is for medical reasons. This is not a repeat of 1953, when we're simply going to, you know, take him back by military force. And the prime minister and the foreign ministers say, we will do everything we can, but we can't guarantee what the reaction will be. So Carter was alerted to that. Okay, point number three, and that is the Iran-Iraq war. This was a time in which we were very close to getting an agreement. We had several with Khomeini vetoed. This would have been an opportunity when perhaps with a maximum uh, transfer of arms, which we had in a warehouse there, they had no spare parts for mostly American-made products. It might have created leverage. We did start to give them some, but not as much as they wanted. The Iran-Contra affair with Reagan, he gave them everything they wanted that would have potentially been an opportunity to give leverage, but at the same time, we didn't want to show while our hostages were there that we were doing this and we had, unless we had absolute assurance that we were going to get them out. But that was another point at which there was a potential for it. But there's no question but that your point, if a superpower can't get its own diplomats out, I mean, that was a fundamental reason we lost the election, without question. And again, I suggest that there were a number of things that could have been done, including blockades of the harbor, 
uh, more arms perhaps to Iran during this time, uh, a more forceful uh, effort rather than going through diplomacy. It showed, and we, you know, I guess one last thing. It's very easy to have 2020 hindsight. At that point, it just wasn't so clear that the civilian government wasn't going to be able to make decisions. We reached a number of hostage agreements with them. And that this aging Ayatollah was going to be the supreme leader. We now know it. I mean, he d doesn't deal with anybody. <laughs> he just makes the decisions. And Rouhani and, and uh, Z you know, uh, Zarif are, if not figureheads, they certainly have to bow to his... To it wasn't that clear at the time. Great. Well, I have more questions, but I, we only have about a half an hour left, so I'd like to open it up to uh, questions. And just please state your name and gentleman here. Yes. Yes, my name is Asun Rafisi. Hey, Thank you very much, John. Uh, name is Asun Rafisi, and thank you very much for the great panel. Although I wish you invited some people who are kind of pro government or pro-stability uh, is to uh, 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 gentleman lady said clearly that they stated their opinion that they are not really uh, for any kind of reform or anything in Iran. But anyways, um, let me ask a question from Ms. Einstein. Uh, you clearly stated how uh, faulty was the policies in the past uh, and uh, you made a great statement that we should not try to change things in a country that we don't know anything about it. Um, what do you think about now? What is, what is your position about uh, the policies of the United States now in Iran? Number one, and I have another question for Mr. Khalaji. <clears throat> he repeatedly said why Iranian regime doesn't change, although 85% people are against it and all that. I think the question is, why should it change? Mm. Uh, uh, I I Iran is not in Europe. Uh, Iran is in the Middle East. Uh, neighboring countries are uh, having worse, if not uh, uh, comparable uh, regimes. And, uh, and uh, besides, Iranians, as you said clearly, or, or Ms. Carr said, Iranians prefer stability to chaos. Uh, and they have experienced chaos long enough to not opt for it again. So uh, it is clear. Moreover, uh, I think there should be a new definition of, of the state, a structure of a state in Iran, which is not really a state in conventional uh, term. It is some kind of Shiite international extension okay. uh, to Iran. It's a Shiite international. We got it. OK. Yeah. Okay, so, so OK, and a couple of answers. First, I want to disabuse you of the notion that what I was saying is the U.S. can't have any influence. Yes, from 7,000 miles away, there are limits to bucking up somebody who's unpopular, but we did everything we could to do so. Perhaps military action could have helped temporarily, but I think only temporarily. So we did send signal after signal to try to buck the Shah up. Second, uh, with respect to uh, the policy today, uh, I have chaired for six years the Iran Task Force at the Atlantic Council. I've met with the foreign ministers three times privately. I support the JCPOA, but at the same time, I also feel that there should be very tough sanctions, tougher sanctions, for their other uh, actions, supporting terrorism, human rights violations, and missile program, and so forth. Uh, and third, the reason why we should continue to be involved directly is because Iran is a threat to stability in the region. They're a threat to our most, their closest, our closest allies in Israel and elsewhere. They're fomenting revolution wherever they can. Uh, they've got 50, now 100,000 Iranian rockets, uh, which uh, Hezbollah has in Lebanon, trained on Israel. They're trying to establish a military base in Syria which will destabilize that country even more. So, and we have every reason uh, as a superpower to be uh, continuing in our actions to try to blunt their efforts. At the same time, 
I think that it's in our interest, I think it's in Israel's interest, to keep the JCPOA alive because I think it blunted their capacity to have a nuclear breakthrough. And that you can have that position and still believe, as I do, in very tough sanctions outside of the nuclear area. Nekti? Um, why regime change in Iran? Because Islamic Republic's uh, decisions dictate regime change in Iran. Because Islamic Republic has closed all doors to any kind of reform, whether uh, in domestic policy or foreign policy. Because Islamic Republic defines itself not as a government, but as the leader of Islamic world defined itself as the opposite pole to the United States and the West. And uh, I think as long as Ayatollah Khamenei alive, at least, uh, there is no possibility for any kind of reform which makes people comfortable to live with this regime or the world. Uh, uh, sure about being uh, become about being um, affordable to um, live with Iran, and I, you know Iranians. No one wants to pay high price when you go to a market. You are looking for the best thing, but with the cheapest price. This is the government who imposes the price of a good life for Iranians and the price of for stability and security for the region. Wait, wait we got we to move on. Okay, thank you. Did you want to comment? Yes, Okay, please. I would like to say that it's obvious that the American government, as a superpower, as a big power, why does it want to change the regime in Iran? It will endanger the security of the Persian Gulf is within the national interests of the U.S. without no doubt, but I would like to say that Iranians, even even the ones who are tired um, of this government and they are not to pay the price, and even the ones who do not want to enter the battlefield, they would love to. They would love something to happen and make them free and save them from this regime. Let's forget about the corruption of this regime, but any movement, any social and civil movement happened in Iran is, is hugely suppressed by the regime. In this room, we do have a, an ex-hostage. And we also have a student who was suffered enough from this regime. I am also present, and I have my own story of getting suffered. So, anyway, the people of Iran, we do, not, we do not have a sincere polling system in Iran, but we can get the sense that the majority of the people does not want this, this regime, without no doubt. But something that makes us worried is that we do not know what is going to happen after that chaos. Let's say if the if the regime falls after the sanctions, we don't know what's going to happen to Iran. This makes many people misunderstood, and they say the ones who have this worry, then they are supportive of the regime. After what happened 40 years ago, we do have to think that what's going to happen next. But the question is, what Iranian people can do? What is the plan of the U.S. government? Or what is predicted in order to manage the chaos? 
I hope that it's not happened, but it will. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm John Limbert, a retired Foreign Service officer, and I'm here today alive I, uh, because probably, with all due respect, I, President Carter, uh, Ambassador Eisenhower, did not listen to you um, after the capture of the embassy and did not take uh, immediate military, military action. Uh, but my question is for uh, Mrs. Carr. By the way, I strongly recommend her book. Crossing the red, uh, crossing the red line. It's uh, it's very, imp very impassioned and has some very amusing parts in it as well. Uh, um, as well, what would you say? What would what would you say? And what should others say to people in this town and in the United States um, who are have become spokespeople for whatever reason for this group, the Mojahedin Echad? Uh, which is making a lot of noise these days, and it's 40 years after Jonestown, um, so it's probably appropriate to talk about this group uh, at this time. Um, at this time, but they seem to have a lot of traction, a lot of money, and a lot of very high-level support. And when we talk about alternatives or what could happen in the future, clearly they want to be part of the discussion. And what would you say to these people? I think you are my I think you are my enemy to ask me this question because answering this question uh, candidly is a little bit dangerous because this group is dangerous and I'm afraid to speak clearly. Yes, they are organized. Yes, they are the only group which which are experienced in terms of politics. They know Iran very well and they know the region very well. We don't know where the money comes from and it's a question. Maybe if I know where the money comes from, I can have a better judgment over them. But because I don't know, it's difficult to judge them. As far as I know, and my knowledge goes back to 17 years ago, I don't want to exaggerate, 17 years ago, I did not find any popularity for this group back in Iran. And the people like me who were not supporting uh, the revolution, we were anti-revolutionaries, they would say that if we come to power, all the activists that were active during Shah, the MEK would say that we were going to take, this all, take all these people to the camp. They, they, were, they were speaking like Khmer Rouge in Cambodge. You asked me a dangerous question, and I answered dangerously. Look, um, MEK is a Stalinist organization. They have a very um, horrible record in, in running the organization in Iraq and elsewhere. Um, one can say that they are the least popular organization in Iran, and it's absolutely wrong to count on them for any um, you know, good scenario for regime change. But having said that, I think that any effort for regime change in Iran or you know, a positive development in Iran should include all political groups, we cannot reject them from, you know, as Iranians. I mean, if Iranians wants to form any kind of uh, uh, effective opposition coalition, 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 coalition or, you know, alliance or something like that, they need to include, they need to be inclusive as much as possible. I'm not sure if they accept that, they are not willing to work with any political party or any political 
group, but I think we should avoid to alienate them in future Iran too. So I'd, I'd like to respond to your opening point. First, I'm very glad you're alive. Uh, uh, but let me, uh, let me suggest that you would still have been alive with our suggestion. Here's the reason. The president rejected uh, blockades or manning the harbor. And Ham Jordan, speaking for him, as Chief of Staff said, oh, the hostages will come out, they'll come out in coffins. Now the reason I think that's not the case is the following. We passed a very clear message from the US through the Swiss to Khomeini that if there were any show trials of any of you, if a hair on your head was damaged, if there was any shooting, any, that there would be the full force of the US military against Iran. And that's, in my opinion, the reason it didn't happen. If we had made a similar threat to them on the hostages, I believe that they would not have started shooting you one by one because Khomeini at that time was really fairly weak in his power. One of the reasons that he reversed himself after the first breach in February of 79 was because he was told by his advisors uh, that he had to get in front of the student movement. And there was still an opportunity for opposition. So he knew that if he, if he in any way harmed any hostages, the full force of the US military would have been uh, put on them. And that's why there was no show trial. It was there was no abuse or torture or whatever. So I use that to buck up my notion that had we extended that to the fact that we would take similar action, if they didn't release you, that would have occurred. Gentleman there. Uh, Greg Rose, former Defense Department. One of the three debate, tripartite debate positions was Brzezinski's, and I have a question about that for Stu Eisenstadt. You seem to acknowledge that Perhaps you're acknowledging that his actual assessment of what was going to happen turned out to be true, that it was like the Russian Revolution. You also, I think, just indicated in your remarks that if the, if the Brzezinski approach had been taken, that maybe it would have actually had some success for a while before ultimately failing. But wouldn't that have been a better outcome than what actually happened, which is that there was no other option? In other words, if Brzezinski's approach had been taken and there had been a military coup and it had maintained power for a year or two, that actually might have given us more options to prevent this great catastrophe, which is the Iranian Revolution. Yes, and that's why I supported it, but, but it seems to me quite clear from ha General Heiser's book. And remember, General Heiser is sent over the deputy commander of NATO. He had met with the Shah earlier, the Shah knew him. He had written an operational doctrine for him, for his military. And what Heiser says in his own book, uh, on the ground at that time, is that he did everything possible, knowing that Sullivan was always trying to undercut him, to get the military, if not a coup, I mean, at that point, in effect, Khomeini wasn't in power, back to year the prime minister was, to back him up fully. And the military simply didn't have the wherewithal to do it. They bowed to the desertions that were occurring daily, thousands and thousands of soldiers. And Khomeini came up with this notion, which I, which I got from one of the interviews, is Yazdi says to him in exile outside of Paris, what you should do is have the women in Iran support you. And the way to do that is say that they won't cook meals for their husbands in the military, and to go out and put flowers in the barrels of all the guns during the demonstrations. And so all the efforts that General Heiser made to try to buck the military up, the desertions were occurring, the soldiers simply didn't have a Shaw or anyone else, Bakhtir was really not a strong person to organize to do so. So 
it was worth a try, and we did, not a full coup, but full support for Bakhtiar. But the military simply was w too weak at the top, and underneath, the support wasn't there for the Shah either. The gentleman right there. I'm not saying, looking to the president, Please I'm not. Yourself. Thank you. It's on. It's on. It's on. Um, I'm not saying when that the current set of sanctions uh, are going to be able to achieve the objectives that the administration has put to uh, strengthen the terms of the JCPOA. Um, the fact of the matter is when we look at the sanctions, it wasn't until 1995 that Clinton put in a comprehensive set of sanctions, 96, the Libya. Iran-Libya Act, which uh, began to apply secondary sanctions, um, started to have a slow impact, but it wasn't until 2010 in United Nations Resolution, uh, was it 2029, 20, I think, that um, there was a comprehensive set of international sanctions against Iran that finally brought them to the table. Right now, the new sanctions that came into effect on November 5th are sectional sanctions with respect to uh, the secondary sanctions. And even there, when it comes to oil, we've already granted exactly. six or seven critical right waivers. So it's hard to see how the present set of sanctions can achieve an objective to bring Iran to the table with the European Union and other countries still uh, fighting us, if I will, resisting us in a setting up new comprehensive yeah. sanctions. And yeah, your I comment agree. on that so, would be so appreciated. So let me respond. First of all, the room is full. I, w I worked in the Carter administration with Peter Rosenblatt, with Mark Ginsburg. I worked with Vic Commerce in the Clinton administration on sanctions. So let me take this on directly because I think it's a very important question. In my opinion, and I know there may be some who disagree, when we had unilateral sanctions against Iran in the Obama administration, they didn't budge. It's only when we convinced the EU to take and a remarkable set of actions. They, they withheld all imports of Iranian oil. That's 16% of all their oil. They had the SWIFT system in Brussels bar any transactions. They agreed with us to sanction the Iranian Central Bank. And it's only when we had that coordinated action with the EU that they came to the negotiating table. You can argue to your blue in the face, could we have gotten more out of the agreement? But it seems to be almost unassailable that only when we got the EU together could we do it. Now, we've got the EU at loggerheads. The secondary sanctions, as you just mentioned, Vic, they've already given a six-month exemption to half a dozen countries, including China, which is a big purchaser of Iranian oil, that they can still purchase it without secondary sanctions. So. It's very problematic that these secondary sanctions will have the kind of impact that they think. Better, from my perspective, and the EU is willing to do that, to keep the JCPOA in force and say to the EU, we're going to back out of it unless you join us more forcefully with sanctions on their support for terrorism, on their, you know, their missile program, and so forth. In other words, keep the EU and the U.S. together as we did during the Obama administration uh, and we did during the Clinton administration with the waivers. Another gentleman right there. Thank you so much. Um, my question is uh, for... Yeah. Is, that is it that? Is it good? Yeah. Just identify yourself. Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Ahmad Batebi. I'm a journalist and former political prisoner. Uh, my question is uh, about sanction, uh, Mrs. Carr and Mr. Khalaj and you, sir. Uh, we know that uh, the uh, Trump administration used sanction as a ma main weapon against uh, the government. And uh, uh, I believe, as a uh, as an Iranian, uh, I grew up in that country. I was a political prisoner near uh, one decade. I was a journalist. I believe um, the only way we can get response from this satanic regime is sanction and pressure. But um, the problem is, uh, when we talk about sanction, that's general concept. And when you put pressure on the, uh, for example, when you sanction, uh, put sanction on SWIFT, um, the 
I mean, main pressure is on Iranian people. Do we have this chance in the United States? Um, uh, we, um, you know, work on smart sanction, which means we pay money, you know, we do research and we find the main source, and after that we put uh, sanction on the uh, Iran government or I mean, other part of the government. How much do we have this capacity? We work on on this concept. I mean, smart sanction, not not general sanction. Thank you. Uh, no. Yes, so, so first of all, as a journalist, I hope your press credentials haven't been pulled by the administration and you can still. <laughs> uh, so smart sanctions, I, I, I considered myself the sanctions meister during the Clinton administration. I did Iran-Libya sanctions, I did Helms-Burton sanctions, I did Freedom Act sanctions. Uh, you know, I've done a lot of sanctions work. And everybody is in favor of smart sanctions. The question is, what is a smart sanction? So the first thing you have to do is, of course, you identify the product of the target company country that's most important to it. Well, here it's oil. Mm. And here you have a very interesting situation. We lost the election, as I mentioned, in part because of Iran, but because of two facets. Everybody focuses on the hostage crisis. The Iranian Revolution cut off four million barrels of oil a day mm. because of strikes in the oil fields and doubled the price of oil and caused gasoline lines. And I remember going to my local Exxon station in Chevy Chase and having to wait 30 minutes to fill a tank to get to the White House to figure out how to end the gasoline lines. Mm. So it had an economic impact. So the administration, one of the reasons they granted this six-month set of waivers, in my opinion, is they're concerned about the oil market and what will happen. Now I think, I mean, they're trying to get the Saudis and others to substitute, and Iran's now making only about two and a half million barrels of oil, not four. So. Uh, they may be able to get away with it, but clearly that's one of the reasons that they've granted this sanction. So the first smart sanction is you figure out what's the most important product. Then the second is you can't do it alone. I mean, we don't import any Iranian oil anyway, so barring Iranian oil doesn't do a damn thing. You've got to get the countries that use it and that brought them to the negotiating table to begin with, but now under the JCPOA, which they're still enforcing, say, well, look, Iran hasn't violated the agreement. The IAEA has said that they're strictly enforcing it. So we're going to continue to take Iranian oil. Now you start to talk about other products like pistachios and so forth. I mean, that's, I don't want to mix metaphors. That's peanuts when you compare to oil. So that a smart sanction means the right product, but it also means doing it multilaterally. We're not going to get the UN to go back again because the UN considers that JCPOA has been followed. So I'm not so sure this sanction is so smart. It will divide the EU. And yes, as I mentioned, no major bank is going to do business with Iran. That will hurt. Yes, major oil companies like Total have pulled out and won't go back in. That will hurt. But still, you're not going to get the full force of sanctions, which is a real oil cutoff, unless you get the EU re-engaged in that, and they're, they're just not going to do it when they're the target of secondary sanctions. Mac Day, the, the last word, because we are at yeah, 2 o'clock. I, I think the sanction obsession has become a problem in Washington. There are many other ways to pressure Iran, including public having an effective public diplomacy. The thing that I kept saying this since, you know, I was born, I think. And uh, sometimes I say that my hope in Iranian democracy is much more than a professional VOA in Washington. We have a horrible broadcasting for Iran. It's disastrous, it's counterproductive, and it should be structurally and fundamentally changed. We have a very bad public diplomacy. We were unable to explain to Iranian people our policy. And every sanction has a, a purpose uh, of uh, political impact. We were not able to use the political impact of sanction in proper way 
I think because of the flawed uh, public diplomacy. We were at two o'clock, so I'm sorry we can't answer all your questions, but the gentleman will be around, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>